Hey, yeah, Cryptozens. Tonight's show, Newsom vetoes AB2269, IRS and John Doe summons, and what's wrong with CDBCs? It's 10 p.m. Pacific. The date is September 25th, 2022. Welcome back to the Crypto Overnighter. My name is Nicodemus, and I'll be your host. The cover model, mascot, and co-host for this podcast is Tex. And together, we take a nightly look at the crypto, NFT, and metaverse space and the industry that surrounds it. If you have questions or comments on the show, come find us on Twitter or email us at nick at cryptoovernighter.com. Keep in mind, nothing in this show should ever be considered financial advice. California Governor Gavin Newsom vetoed the Assembly Bill 2269. This bill was meant to establish a licensing and regulatory framework for digital assets. And the reason cited by Newsom was that he believed that the bill was premature. In his opposition to the bill, Newsom recommended a, quote, more flexible approach that would evolve over time, an approach that would both consider the safety of consumers as well as keeping an eye on the bottom line. He said, quote, it is premature to lock a licensing structure in statute without considering both the work in house efforts to create a transparent regulatory environment and forthcoming federal actions. As it currently stands, it is Newsom's belief that this bill would require tens of millions of dollars in loans, and those loans would come from the state's general fund. He said, quote, such a significant commitment of general fund resources should be considered and accounted for in the annual budget process. Now, make no mistake, this does not make life any easier for crypto systems working in the California space. They still have to contend with the state's existing money transmitter laws. The problem is that these laws were written with traditional fiat-based businesses in mind. They don't take into con account the unique nature of digital assets. This means that crypto companies in California are going to have to get creative in how they structure their businesses in order to comply with the law. And it also means that the state is missing out on the benefits of a well-regulated digital asset industry that could bring. It's worth noting that Newsom isn't the only one who has raised concerns about the bill. The California Chamber of Commerce also came out against it, saying that it would create a, quote, unnecessary and duplicative regulatory regime. So for now, it looks like crypto companies in California will have to continue to operate in a regulatory gray area. But with the state's economy being as large as it is, it's still an attractive market for digital asset businesses. Now for his part, Newsom seems to be waiting on the federal government. He said that he wants federal regulations to come into sharper focus for digital assets. He also called on the legislature to revisit this issue next year in light of any federal actions that may have been taken by then. So it looks like the digital asset industry in California will have to wait a little longer for clarity on the regulatory front. In the meantime, they'll just have to keep operating in the gray area and hope for the best. As we like to do on this show, let's take a look at the numbers. At the time of writing, the global crypto market cap is $925 billion. That's down 0.86%. The top five cryptos by market cap are Bitcoin down 0.75%, Ethereum down 1.38%, Tether, USDC, and Binance Coin down 0.3%. The Internal Revenue Service can issue a John Doe summons to a bank that provided services for customers of cryptocurrency prime broker SFOX. It, this is according to a New York judge ordered on Thursday. This ruling will allow IRS to continue looking for potential tax evaders in an ongoing probe. U.S. Judge Paul Gardif said Thursday that the IRS could serve a John Doe summons on My Safra Bank. The bank is a service provider to customers of cryptocurrency prime broker SFOX, which is not currently a defendant in the court case. Gardif said that the IRS had demonstrated that it is entitled to the service of the summons on the bank as the agency had provided enough evidence 
to suggest that the summons was necessary to investigate potential tax evaders. Gurdjieff said, quote, The IRS has met its burden in establishing that the information it seeks from the SFOX customers as a class is reasonably described by the John Doe summons and that the information is necessary to determine compliance with internal revenue laws. The IRS is trying to track down potential tax evaders and has been seeking information about SFX customers since September of 2019. The John Doe summons will allow the agency to access the bank records of those customers, including the identities of the customers and the transactions that they conducted through the platform. The IRS had originally filed four summons in February, but the platform was able to temporarily stop the IRS from serving the summons on the bank. The cryptocurrency trading platform filed a motion to squash the summons in March, claiming that the IRS had not provided enough evidence to suggest that potential tax evaders were using the SFOX platform to avoid taxes. SFOX has also filed a motion to dismiss the IRS's request, claiming that the agency lacks standing to bring the action. While the John Doe summons was originally directed at SFOX, the IRS also sought to summon the bank as well as a service provider to the prime broker. Gardif said in his order that the IRS had provided enough evidence to suggest that the summons was necessary to investigate potential tax evaders. So, like I said, the IRS is trying to track down potential tax evaders, and they've been seeking information from SFOX about their customers since December of 2019. This John Doe summons will finally allow the agency to access those bank records. The global NFT market cap is up 2.81%. Sales volume is down 1.53%. According to CoinMarketCap, the top five NFT collections by sales volume are Mutant Apes, followed by Bored Apes, CryptoPunks, Bull Bitcoin Club, and Quantum Ape Father. Now keep in mind, some of these collections have very volatile prices. So, do your own research. What's wrong with CBDCs? Well, there are a few reasons why central bank digital currencies could be considered bad. First, CDBCs could potentially give the banks too much control over the economy. For example, a CDBC could be used to track and control how much money is spent, which could lead to central banks having too much power over people's financial lives. In addition, CBDCs could make it more difficult for people to anonymously transact which means that that would give the government more surveillance and more intrusion into people's private lives. Also, CBDCs could make it easier for central banks to engage in inflationary policies, and that would devalue people's savings and purchasing power. So not only would they lead to a loss of privacy, governments are sure to use them as tools of financial discrimination. Right now, the U.S. is contemplating this move to a CDBC. Meanwhile, countries like China and the Bahamas, they've already piloted them. The next phase of China's pilot project will onboard more people than we have in the entire United States. And China is known for surveilling their own population as well as foreigners. So it's not a big leap to see how a CDBC could be used as a tool of oppression. So it would seem like CDBCs are inevitable. We're moving more and more towards a cashless society. And something has to be the currency in those kinds of societies. Stable coins, I think, are a much better choice than CDBCs. Now, right now, some people think that CDBCs are just fine. That they're just like crypto. They're kind of a gateway to get people interested in trusting them. Well, in fact, central bank digital currencies are not just fine. They're the opposite of crypto. Where CBDCs offer control and surveillance, stablecoins offer freedom and privacy. And CDBCs are also dependent on their host economy. So if the economy tanks, so does the value of the CDBC. Stablecoins, on the other hand, are tracked by real assets. So they maintain their value even when the economy is struggling. See, stablecoins, by their very nature, work to protect investors against crypto's volatile price swings. 
And CDBCs, like stablecoins, can use distributed ledger technology, just like real crypto. And also, central banks might provide API access to connect with the core ledger. Now, people really started talking about CDBCs as a payment instrument during the pandemic. With people being told to stay home and not go out, there was a big push for contactless payments, which are just another form of digital payments. There's a few reasons for this. First, digital payments are more efficient than cash. They're also more secure because there's no risk of losing or having your cash stolen. And second, digital payments can be made using mobile phones, which is convenient for people who are on the go. And finally, digital payments can be made using a variety of digital currencies, which is helpful for people who travel internationally. So it's not surprising that central banks are considering launching their own digital currencies. However, there are a few potential problems with this idea. First, central bank digital currencies could give central banks too much control over the economy. For example, a central bank could use a digital currency to track and control how much money is spent, which could lead to central banks having too much power over people's financial lives. Second, central bank digital currencies could make it more difficult for people to anonymously transact, which could lead to more government surveillance and intrusion into people's private lives. And finally, central bank digital currencies could make it easier for central banks to engage in inflationary policies. This would devalue people's savings and purchasing power. So while central bank digital currencies have the potential to provide some benefits, there are also some huge drawbacks that should be considered. For example, government-issued CDBCs belong to the government. They have complete control, which means they get to set the rules for circulation, usage, availability. The government holds the ledger, either directly or by controlling the validators. Either way, the danger is that the government will be able to see how you're spending your money as well as blocking transactions from going through. They could also inflate the money supply, causing the value to go down. So while cryptocurrencies allow you to transact directly with anyone, no interference, no government oversight, CDBCs do just the opposite. CDBCs inject the government into every transaction. Every single exchange sees the government acting as middleman between the buyer and the seller. So not only will they lead to a loss of privacy, governments are sure to use them as tools of financial discrimination. In other words, central bank digital currencies are bad because they would give too much control to the central banks over the economy. And that makes it more difficult for people to anonymously transact and make it easier for central banks to engage in their inflationary policies. And another issue to keep in mind when comparing centralized and decentralized architectures, single point of failure. Anytime you have a single point of control, like you do with CDBCs, you also have a single point of failure. So if the government's servers go down, or the government decides to shut down the system, anyone who's using the CDBC would be just out of luck. On the other hand, a decentralized system like crypto, there is no single point of failure. Even if one exchange goes down, there are hundreds of others that people can use. And if the government tries to shut down the system, there are ways around it. So not only are CDBCs bad for privacy, they're also bad for security. And when I say bad for security, that means hackers. A single point of access and single point of control also means it's much easier to hack. For a CDBC, you only really have to hack one point. To control real crypto, you have to hack every single node on the network. Not very practical. Or at least 51% of them. So not only will CDBCs lead to more government control and more government surveillance, they're also more vulnerable to hacking. And then finally, what happens to private banks? They're not needed anymore. The Federal Reserve is your bank now. The Federal Reserve holds the ledger. Even in a hybrid system, this will still cause problems. The government will still have control over the system, and they'll still be able to see how you're spending your money. The only difference is that private banks will still exist, but they'll be subject to the same rules and regulations as the government. People will be more likely to feel safer with the government holding on to their money. So imagine the bank runs. You know, the first real sign of trouble and people are going to pull their money out of their private banks 
and put them into the central bank. Can you say bank run? So not only are CDBCs for bad for privacy and bad for security, they're also bad for the economy. When you hear people talking about central bank digital currencies, just remember they're bad for privacy, they're bad for security, and they're bad for the economy. So we're going to call it there for the night. I did something a little different. Uh, that last story, as you can tell, is just opinion. There's no news to analyze. Let me know what you think of it. In the meantime, I want to thank you, my listeners, because when you stop listening, I will stop talking. Take care of yourselves, but take care of each other too. We'll see you tomorrow night.